So I thought about what I should use as a hook to start this video, but I, for the life of me, I can't come up with one. So we're just going to get straight into it. I've spent half of my life, 14 years, trying to build businesses. Out of the many I started, most of them failed. Only two have succeeded. And while I'm not an expert, while I'm not the best solopreneur or entrepreneur in the world, obviously, I have made a lot of mistakes and I have learned a few things along the way that I'm going to share with you. This video is completely unscripted other than a few bullet points that I have on this page just so I don't get completely derailed. There's about 10, 11 points here that I'm going to talk about. Before I do, just to give you some context, I uh, started my or tried to start my first business, we won't even call it that, at 14, I was importing clothing from the United States and selling them in New Zealand um, and making a profit. And the first mistake I made is that I didn't capitalize on it. It was working, but I was 14 and I was kind of lazy. Well, I was interested in other things like skateboarding uh, and music. So I just never really doubled down. Second, I started a skateboarding blog wrote like 90 articles in a year and made nothing, also a failure. Then I started another blog. Funnily enough, it was a personal development blog when I was 17 and didn't know anything. Good one. Uh, and that also failed. And then I started EDM Prod, which also started out as a blog. That one happened to work. Took a couple of years, but uh, it was a great business. I still own it and it still makes me money today even though I'm not directly involved. And yeah, that's kind of like the, the short version. And there's a few other bits and pieces uh, that go alongside all those, a bunch of side projects that I won't talk about because it will take too long. So the first one is that execution matters more than strategy, but strategy still matters. People tend to make one of two mistakes. I've made both. They are either overly strategic and that they think and they plan and they strategize far too much without doing enough execution, without doing enough work, taking enough action on things to validate things and get data. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have people who just blindly execute. High energy people, type A people who push, push, push. They work really hard. Uh, but a lot of that work is, is wasted because they're doing it ineffectively or they're doing it in a direction that just isn't that leveraged. Like maybe they're getting a 1x return on their time. Whereas if they had, if they were able to step back and be a little bit more strategic, they could be getting far more return on their time investment. So you need execution. That's like table stakes. If you're not executing at a reasonable level, if you're not putting in the deep work, if you're not sitting down, showing up every day, being consistent, then any strategy that you come up with is useless because it has zero power by itself. That's table stakes. But you cannot ignore the strategy piece, like I just talked about. The ability to step back, to look at your business from like a bird's eye perspective, to look at where the bottlenecks are, to look at where the opportunities are, to look at what the 20% of what you're doing that's producing 80% of the results is, that's high leverage work. Might not feel like it when you're under pressure and things are, fires that you need to pull fires out and all that kind of stuff, but it's super useful work. And to give you an anecdote, with EDM Prod, the music production course business I built, there were so many times where I was just blindly executing. Like we were just pushing in a, a direction and it wasn't until we looked back we were like, huh, that was a mistake. We shouldn't have done it that way. If we had just stopped, slowed down, looked at what was actually working, uh, we could have sped things up, grown the business much faster. Uh, and it was my fault, obviously. You need to be executing, 100%. You need to be good at executing. Most people are not. Most people are, like tend towards strategy too much, but you cannot ignore the strategy piece. One thing that's helped me a lot, and I only picked this up in recent years, is sitting down once a week with pen and paper. 
setting aside like 30 minutes, doesn't have to be much more. And just thinking through a, a problem that I'm dealing with in the business or in life, just pen and paper, like literally just a notebook like this. I'll sit outside, uh, I'll go to a cafe and I'll just get a pen and I'll just write stuff out, I'll diagram, I'll do what I need to do. Being away from the computer, being away from the temptation and the distractions uh, to work is very useful and it might seem to you like, oh, of course, this is, I do this anyway all the time, but it's a good way to to be a bit more strategic, to slow down, to look at your business. So if, you, if you're the person who tends to just blindly execute and move in a direction, consider doing that. Start once a week, maybe on a Monday morning or Friday morning or something like that. Get away, get a notebook and just think. Think through your business. Think through the major problems you're dealing with. Think through the opportunities. Think through the bottlenecks. There's a great book called The Road Less Stupid, which I highly suggest that you read because uh, that'll give you some questions to ponder while you think about your business. So that's point one. Execution matters more than strategy, but strategy still matters. The second one is to sell before you build. I see a lot of people, and I've made this mistake too, they spend months and months on a product, like a, a course, for example. They spend months building an online course or digital product, and then they promote it to the audience, they launch it, and nothing. I remember auditing someone's business uh, for them to come on as a client, and they told me that they, they, they had a coaching business, they launched a course, and I think their email list was 5,000 people, so not small, they launched their course and got two sales. And I asked how long this person spent on the course and she said six months. She had spent six months on a product that she hadn't validated. Can you imagine? Hopefully you, you have to imagine you haven't experienced it. If you have, um, I'm sorry, that's uh, it's a lot of work. So sell before you build. I learned this lesson in a very powerful way from a coach that was working with me at the time many years ago. We looked at our business at the business and we knew that we needed to make a, a course for beginner music producers. All this traffic was coming to the site. We didn't have anything to offer them. Uh, and so we needed to build that. And I had gone away and I started mapping out this comprehensive course. You know, I'd spent weeks on it. I was starting to build it and he just said to me, no, 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 don't do that. Make it simple. Make it like four songs in four weeks or something like that. Get a sales page up and do pre-orders. And if you don't get 50 sales, refund everyone and don't make the course. It's not the right offer. And initially when he said that, I was, I was thinking, nah, that's, you know, no way, like I'm not going to ask people for money before I even built something. There's just like a weird mental thing around that. But he insisted. And I thought, you know what, if, if I, I can refund them, if it doesn't work out, that's fine. So I got the sales page up. I came up with the idea. I mapped it all out, wrote some sales copy, launched it to the list, and we made 100 sales. And that was the most amount of money that the business had made in like a week in its history, well, up until that point. And that just changed, that changed everything. It was like, oh, you can validate something and then build it. Yes, you have to rush to build it. Like I was, I was working hard after that to fulfill and to develop the course week by week. But it's much better than spending six months on something only for it not to sell. So sell before you build. There's so many ways to do this. Uh, by the way, you need people to give you money. You can't just put up a waiting list and say that that's validation. Anyone, anyone will sign up for a waiting list. It doesn't cost them anything other than their email. But to get them to pay you money is a different story. So don't think that just because you put up a waiting list for a digital product, a service, or a course, that that has validated what you're selling. 
all it shows is that people are maybe interested, right? What you really want is to ask people, hey, give me this money now. It's going to be ready in a couple of weeks or a couple of months. Uh, you'll have early access. It's going to be discounted. And if none of it works out, I'll give you your money back. Now, I wish I'd stuck with that way of doing things, of selling before I built. But unfortunately, I didn't. I made another mistake after that, which leads me to my next point. After the success of the beginner's course that I had sold before I built and then launched and relaunched and so on and so on, I'll be honest, I've got a bit of an ego. I thought that maybe I had the golden touch and that I could just make courses. And a big mistake I made was thinking I don't have to do the whole validation thing. I know my customers so well. Look at look at how this launch went. I can do this again and again with different courses and different products. And so that's what I tried for an entire year. I think we launched four different products in that year. None of them did that well. Sure, they'd make a little bit of money during launch, but they didn't sell much after that. And it wasn't until 12 months later that we realized, damn it, we should have doubled down on the beginner's course we'd built that works, that sells consistently. What are we doing focused on all this other stuff? And so that's the next piece of advice. If something's working in your business, don't just leave it. Don't just go, cool, that's working. Let me go work on this. Let me go try this. It's like, no, no, no. If that's working, double down on it. Because it's hard to make a product or a service that sells well. And when you do, when you get it to a point where it's doing pretty well, usually you can just fan those flames. You can make it sell even more. And we didn't realize that at the time. We wasted like an entire year and then got to the point where it's like, oh, we should have been doing this. Let's do that now. And once we doubled down on that product, then the business really changed. The next piece of advice is to learn in order to solve problems that exist right now, not problems that might exist in the future. A big mistake I made and actually continue to make, it's a tendency of mine, is to spend a lot of time researching, reading books, watching podcasts, YouTube videos on certain things. I remember, I think it was the early days of business, uh, I had maybe, I think I had an intern or like part-time employee and I was reading books on like management, um, like big team management, things like that. And it was really just a form of mental masturbation. It was like half sort of dreaming, like me imagining what it would be like to have 50 people. And it made me feel good. And I convinced myself that I was learning things. But it's, it's like what I should have done was just execute or like learn how to manage one person or something like that. A lot of people get into this trap where it's like you're learning. It's like the levels in the video game. It's like you're at level one. You're learning these skills for like level 20, but you actually need these other skills right now to get to level two. That's what you should be focusing on. That's what you should be learning. Otherwise, you're really just procrastinating. And it's like, sure, if in your free time, if you want to read a book about business that's like levels ahead, do it. It can't harm you necessarily, but, but don't tell yourself that it's useful for you right now. It's the most useful thing you can do because usually it's not. The next thing that took me far too long to truly internalize and I don't think I've fully internalized it yet is that you as the founder whether you've got a team whether you're a solopreneur or not you are the bottleneck what that means is that if you are constantly tired if you struggle to make decisions if you lack confidence if you get complacent and lazy all those things affect things downstream in your business. You are the bottleneck and your company, the thing you're building or the thing you've built is going to be affected by how you are affected by other things. When I got complacent in business, my business 
started to decline. It started to stagnate. Why? (laughs) Because I was. I wasn't doing certain things. I wasn't pushing things forward, right? Even when you have a team, there's still this is still a risk. A team doesn't mean that you can just slack off all the time. It mitigates it compared to when you're just a solo founder or solopreneur where like everything depends on you, but it's still downstream even when you have a team. That's why you see these big companies that get complacent and they get disrupted. They get too comfortable. The CEO gets too comfortable. The founder gets too comfortable. The leadership team gets too comfortable and everything starts to stagnate and decline. So you are the bottleneck. What that means is that you should be investing in yourself, your personal development, getting coaches, investing in your education, and taking care of yourself and your health. Because at the end of the day, state matters. I've talked about this before on the channel. If your state is bad, it's going to affect everything. Next, it's not about growing fast, though there's nothing wrong with growing fast. It's about growing and staying in the game longer than everybody else. There's people who've done who've done this longer than me, who've been in the business world for many decades. Um, like I said, it's been 14 years for me, but in that time, I've seen a lot of friends, I've seen a lot of peers build things really fast, reach success pretty quickly, and then completely burn out, or their business fails, or things change, and they're gone. There's something about persistence and about staying in the game and looking at it with a long-term strategy. The person who can outlast the other, or the business who can outlast the other business usually wins. So when you see people around you who are growing really quickly, you can learn from that. But as long as you're still playing the game and as long as you're still growing at some rate, it's good. Keep doing it. One specific thing about solopreneurship that I want to mention and I've been both I've had I've had the business where it's just me I've had a team uh, and you know the people who say like one person businesses are the best and so on and so on you got to take that with a grain of salt because they're usually trying to sell you something don't choose to be a solopreneur just because you're uncomfortable building a team if you've never tried to build a team first of all how do you know that it's going to be uncomfortable You might actually love it and you might get a lot of gratification out of it. Second, there's things, there's benefits that you get from a team that you can't get from solopreneurship. Namely, usually when you're a solopreneur, everything's dependent on you. And a lot of these solopreneurs, these one-person businesses, it's not a business. They can't take two weeks off, especially if it's a service business. They can't take two weeks off and not have their revenue go down. I heard a great thing on the podcast the other day. It was Nathan Barry's podcast, Billion Dollar Creator. And he interviewed, uh, I think it was a guy called Grant Baldwin and Brian Harris. And Brian Harris said this thing of like, you, you know, you see a lot of these solopreneurs, these creators who have gone and they've tried building a team and then they they come back and they, they go, oh, no, 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 that was, that was too stressful. You know, I, I'm just going to do the solo thing. And what he said was like, He's not actually that convinced that that was the right move for them. A lot of people do it not out of a place of identity and strength, but rather fear and weakness. I'm paraphrasing, but that was a rough saying. And it's like, yes, building the team is hard. So is doing it solo. It's like, pick your heart. And he kind of said at some point when you're building a team, you build these skills, you learn how to lead, you learn how to manage, um, you move through that kind of valley of despair, you come out the other side and things are a lot better. And I think Grant Borden said like, he's having more fun than ever with a team of you know 40 or so people than he had beforehand. So if you're someone who thinks, I'm just gonna do the solopreneur thing, I, the idea of having a team just, it doesn't interest me. It's like, I would just encourage you to not close yourself off to that, opportunity another thing that uh, brian harris said that i I really liked was like we're just not made to be working alone all the time and like not talk to anyone which is 100 percent true uh and i've found it way more fun to be working with the team than to not be building the business that 
maximizes revenue and profit and building the business that you want in terms of lifestyle can often be intention. You might be able to make more money if you pack your calendar with sales calls, but if it stresses you out to the point where you hate your life, is it worth it? And so there's always this tension of like building a business that you like, building a business that doesn't stress you out too much and maximizing growth. And it's easy to say, well, I'll just do this. Why would I, you know, why would I try and maximize growth if it's going to cause stress? And it's like, it's not that simple because if you just spend all your time here, uh, you can end up in stasis and you can end up too comfortable. And you've got this little lifestyle business that like makes you some money, but you get a few years in and uh, you're not happy at all because you're not growing and you're not being challenged and you're not learning new skills. And ask me how I know that because I've been there and... The four-hour workweek dream is not as cool as you think it is. At some point, you achieve it, and then you realize the thing that brings you joy and fulfillment is the process of growing, of learning, of being challenged, of getting to the next level. So there's a tension there, and you have to think about that for yourself and experience it and figure out where you want to sit along that spectrum from like comfort, lifestyle, to growth. For me, at the moment, I'm like in the middle, but more towards this side because I've missed the process of uh, being really busy and being really challenged and I, I kind of crave that at the moment. But I'm sure I'll tip over too far and maybe in like 12 to 24 months, I'll, I'll be looking at the other end of the spectrum and wanting to head back a little bit. That's just how it works. A good question to ask yourself is like, what will I not tolerate and what... Uh, my sort of hard lines. So it might be that if this starts to clearly and obviously affect my relationship with my family, like with my wife and kids, over sustained, uh, sustained, sustained extended time frame, then I've I've gone too far and I need to scale the business back because nothing is worth nothing is worth uh, relationship breakdown. So figure out what that is, like what will you tolerate, what will you not tolerate and what type of business do you not want to build? If you want to be a solopreneur, stay a solopreneur. You don't need to build a business in a certain way. Plenty of people out there who make good money with a business they really like. Plenty of people out there who hate their business and make great money but they're unhappy because they show up at work every day and they just hate it. What's the point? Okay, I have three more points that I'm going to make and then we'll wrap this up. Pay people for their time to solve specific issues. I wish I'd learned this earlier. I spent so much money on like courses and, and stuff like that. And after a while, I realized I can just email someone or message them, uh, an expert in a certain area or field, pay them for an hour of their time usually ask specific questions and get a ton of value out of that hour. I've done this time and time again. It's something I still do to this day. If I've got specific questions, I'll email someone and just say, hey, can I pay you for an hour? And it's usually a lot higher value than like a marketing course or something like that um, because you can ask specific questions about your business and get specific feedback. Coaches are a great example of this. Look, in the coaching world, there's just a lot of noise and there's a lot of bad coaches out there. But the guy who told me to sell before I built, he was coaching me at the time. I mean, he he radically changed the direction I was taking with with business, whether he knows it or not. Uh, Sure, he might say, well, you took the action and you took the responsibility and so on and so forth. But if it weren't for him... It might have taken me a lot longer to kind of get that unlock and find that, you know, point of clarity. This is what I'm going to do and this is how I should do it. Probably one of the biggest benefits to paying people for their time or paying for a coach or someone is that it gives you an outside third party objective observer, someone who's not necessarily invested in your business, someone who's not seen it day to day, but can look at it and perhaps see things in that business that you are blind to because you're just in it every day. All right, last piece of advice is that the biggest productivity killer in business, besides just pure procrastination, 
watching Netflix, going on your phone, whatever, is doing work that is fun to you but doesn't move the needle. But you kind of convince yourself that you need to do it. When I look back at my time running EDM prod, one of the biggest time wasters on my part was spending hours upon hours upon hours designing websites, landing pages, all this kind of stuff and trying to make it like pixel perfect. First of all, I should have hired someone to do it, but I kept telling myself the story that, oh, I can do it better. Or I tried hiring these designers and I just didn't do a good job. And like at the end of the day, there were other companies in our industry selling more product with worse looking sales pages uh, because the copy was good or the offer was good or whatever. And it's like, I enjoyed the work and that's why I kept doing it because I, I could get stuck in, I could spend hours, it made me feel productive. I'd come away from it feeling like, oh, I did some good work, but it wasn't moving the needle at all. I could have been spending that time doing something more important or just like enjoying life and it wouldn't have made a difference. So again, let me repeat, the biggest productivity killer, the biggest business growth killer maybe, is doing work that come, that's fun to you but doesn't move the needle and you convince yourself that it's important. Don't do that. And once you identify it, write it down somewhere, tell someone, whether it's a team member, business partner, coach, say, look, I have a tendency to edit the landing page design for like three hours on a Saturday. I can't be doing that. It's not important. Identify it and then stop doing it because it will waste so much time and it will pull you away from the stuff that is actually important. One thing I found with that is that usually... I usually did that work when I was avoiding something as well. Like there was work that needed to be done or like maybe something uncomfortable. Like I needed to, I don't know, have a conversation with a team member or something like that. And I would just like drown myself with this sort of busy work. There's a lot more that I could say on the topic of solopreneurship business. This wasn't really about solopreneurship, but whatever. Uh, and maybe I'll make a part two. But yeah, just 